This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Right, well, uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. I'm going to speak very briefly about um, Mandela and the arms deal. I'm going to focus on a couple of very brief sort of narrative discussions. The first is about what the arms deal was, what it featured, what the sort of the key role of the arms deal was in sort of South Africa's post-apartheid politics. Mandela's specific role in the arms deal, what that says about the nature of his governance. Um, and then last, which I think is probably the most uh, useful avenue of discussion, is the uses and abuses of Mandela's memory, uh, especially since his passing in relation to the arms deal. So the arms deal was initiated in, in 1997. That's when the request for information, as they were called, was sent out to various international suppliers, although there was a huge amount of, of lobbying by powerful players, including Defence Minister Joe Medice and the arms of service from about 1993 onwards. Uh, the final contracts were signed in December 1999, uh, and South Africa bought a range of quite sophisticated uh, material, fighter jets, submarines, uh, frigates, and light utility helicopters, um, all of which were used to quell the danger of uh, the military superpower of Botswana and Lesotho. Um, <laughs> there was a huge amount of contestation about the the reasons why we went for the arms deal, I still firmly believe there was no rational reason for the arms deal being pursued, that uh, the defense review made it incredibly clear that the biggest dangers to South Africa's security, security were inequality and unemployment, neither of which the arms deal helped. Uh, the total cost of the arms deal, as, as Desne mentioned, is roughly 60 to 70 billion rand. Uh, that figure is now a little bit contested. My original estimation was 72 billion rand. Uh, during the Security Commission of Inquiry, the Department of Finance actually decided to give us some information for the first time in about five years. The good news about that is I think we can, we can downrate the cost to about 60 to 65 billion rand. But it's still an absolutely enormous amount of money. And to put it into context, between 1999 and 2008, when the primary spending on the arms deal occurred, uh, more was spent on the arms deal than the entire Department for the Budget of Housing. In fact, it was 50% larger than the Department for the Budget of Housing. Combined, it was a bigger spend than uh, all spending on low-cost housing provision, uh, the provision of ARVs and tertiary uh, and bursaries for tertiary students. So it's an absolutely enormous quantity of money, and we believe a, a huge opportunity cost uh, was uh, incurred on the South African economy. Uh, every contract, unfortunately, was was riven with cor corruption. We can point to every single contract in the deal and say that they are very serious and well evidenced. Uh, causes for concern. Probably the most notorious example is the selection of the BAE Hawk uh, jet, trainer jet. Uh, in that instance, the department, uh, sorry, Joe Medice uh, made it his business to instruct the selection team to disregard cost as a criteria in the selection process, which I've argued for quite a long time is entirely unconstitutional, not just irrational. Uh, it then subsequently emerged through a UK serious fraud office investigation that BAE through various subsidiaries, in particular Red Diamond, uh, based in the British Virgin Islands, had paid over 115 million pounds in commissions to middlemen and agents for the Safkin deal. One of those agents was uh, a man by the name of Fana Klangwane, advocate Fana Klangwane, who at the time of the arms deal was the special advisor to Defense Minister Joe Medice. Um, and they, the, the serious fraud office believed that these payments were part of a conspiracy to commit corruption. Now, what was Mandela's role in the arms deal? Unfortunately, Mandela's role, and, and we had to speak about Mandela, is that he had very little role whatsoever. The de, the de jure head of the selection committee was cabinet, but in reality, the, the de facto place where decisions were actually made, where decisions were made between various suppliers and the contracts were entered, was the cabinet subcommittee that oversaw the arms deal. That was headed by Thabo Mbeki and included Joe Medice, Stella Sakhal, and Trevor Manuel. Um, the only two times Mandela's name actually comes up in relation to the arms deal is in relation to corruption allegations, interestingly enough. The first was that um, there was a sanctions buster by the name of Tony Georgiades, who was very close to F.W. de Klerk uh, during the party period. In fact, if anybody remembers that far back, uh, F.W. de Klerk actually ended up stealing Georgiades' wife uh, in 1994. <laughs> After 1994, Tony Georgiadis seems to have quite a, a powerful role as, a, as an influence peddler uh, within the, the new ANC. In 1999, he made three separate 500,000 RAND donations. One was to the Nelson Mandela Children's Charity, 
uh, another was to a charity set up by Glass and Michelle, and another was to the ANC itself. The importance of this is that Tony Georgiadis was actually the main agent that had been uh, contracted by both the German Frigate Consortium and the German Submarine Consortium uh, to help lobby for their, their selection in the South Afghan arms deal. Now, in that instance, those donations took place in December 1999. That, those decisions had already been made. Um, and I have not seen any indication, uh, any hard indication that these were specifically to gain some sort of corrupt benefit, although Mandali even knew about that. And, and the reason I say that is because Georgiadis made these, these donations incredibly public. You'd imagine that a corruption scheme would be something done in secret. Uh, he, he actually sent these check stubs to various business people and to the media saying, please, won't you match these donations? I'm, I'm a, a great philanthropist. The second time was in relation to something that came up in the Shabir Sheikh trial. Uh, there was notes uncovered of uh, internal meetings of a French company by the name of Thompson CSF who were looking to get a, a big part of the Corvette contract. Uh, in their notes, they said they were trying very hard to get hold of, of Nelson Mandela and had employed the services or were trying to employ the services or at least contact a man by the name of the tailor who eventually turned out to be uh, a, a man by the name of Yusuf Serti, who was actually Mandela's tailor. Now, it, it does seem that there was one meeting, or Serti certainly claims that there was one meeting set up um, between Thompson CSF and Mandela, but it, it appears that Mandela's role in the arms deal was so marginal that he was no longer a target of, um, a target of, of lobbying or of influence, if, if you will. The, in the end, what actually happened was that uh, Thompson CSF struck a relationship, as we now know, with Shabir Sheikh and his company in Corby Holdings, and also entered a black empowerment deal with uh, a company by the name of Futuristic Business Solutions, which featured relatives of Joe Medice. So I think it, it's relatively indicative of how unimportant Mandela was in the arms deal to an extent, that uh, he wasn't even seen as a, as a target of lobbying. I've certainly not seen any evidence that, that he received any corrupt benefit or, or was involved in any of these corrupt discussions. Um, so when I've been asked to speak about Mandela and the arms deal and, and what I can interpret in terms of governance, it's quite hard to do because it's quite hard to speak to an absence. Um, I think what is very clear if you look at the, the record of post-apartheid South Africa is that Mandela's role in some of the key decisions that determine, have determined the last 20 years of our, our political economy, I'm thinking specifically about gear and, and the arms deal, um, is that he played almost no role whatsoever. That certainly that was, those were processes led by Mbeki. What I do think is quite useful to understand though is that Mbeki, while he was in power, often worked best in partnership with people as a duo. Mbeki developed a reputation. He was the hard man. He was gonna get his hands dirty. He would put through gear. He would keep the unions quiet. There was a very famous incident. We actually went to go speak to the to, uh, Kusatu and told them that they had no, no longer had a role uh, in politics uh, in any sort of meaningful sense and had to accept gear by hook or by crook. Mandela's role in that, in that instance was to uh, smooth the ruffled feathers, to make sure that everything carried on, keep unity within government, keep unity within the alliance. We saw that as well with Jacob Zuma. Um, Jacob Zuma's role in a partnership with Mbeki, and Mbeki would ruffle feathers, make the, make the ugly noises, and Jacob Zuma was sent into parliament, sent to meet with, with allies and calm them down, talk them back, sort of take the edge off Mbeki's uh, vitriol, which is essentially where Jacob Zuma drew his support from uh, as he fell out with Mbeki. It's also interesting to see that it, without that coverage, without that person who made, who uh, covered up the worst of Mbeki's spiky personality, Mbeki was essentially left completely marginalized within the ANC. He needed that cover. He needed somebody to, to, to make sure that he was still an acceptable proposition. Um, he had that under, with Mandela, um, and he had that with Jacob Zuma. And when Jacob Zuma left, he was sort of left in the cold. So considering how limited Mandela's role in the arms deal was, it's remarkable just how often his name has been brought up in relation to it, and certainly doing my research. Uh, Indeed, Mandela's memory, both keeping it intact and its almost alchemical power of conferring legitimacy, has often been a subtle undertow running beneath the arms deal. During my research into the arms deal, uh, individuals who are close to the government um, would often t take me aside and warn me that my research would turn up unsavory facts about Mandela. The inference was always the same, that if I found it, I'd be duty-bound to report it, and the backlash against me and my colleagues would be profound. In addition, if I was to report on any negative findings against Mandela, I would actively 
I'd be actively undermining the post-apartheid democratic project as Mandela the icon was so central to its foundational myths. Like I've said, I've always doubted that Mandela was involved in any such shady activity. And I've always seen, no, uh, and I've seen no evidence of his participation in any meaningful way. As such, I've always found those warnings distasteful and disingenuous, but illustrative of, of how far often senior people in government who go to use and abuse Mandela's image and memory for aims that Mandela himself would no doubt find abhorrent. Such uses and abuses of Mandela's memory have come up frequently during the recent Sariti Commission of Inquiry into the arms deal, of which I'm supposed to be a, a critical witness, uh, and I was subpoenaed about two years ago to appear. Um, despite the fact that Mandela's involvement in the arms deal was completely marginal, um, the fact that it took place under his watch has been used by a number of people who've appeared before the commission to justify the arms deal. That was a, a key thread that was running through the presentations of, of Alec Irwin, Trevor Manuel, uh, of, um, of Thabo and Becky himself. Uh, and the person who's made that argument most forcefully is a man by the advocate uh, Murani Murani, who is the advocate who, who protects the interests of the ministerial subcommittee that oversaw the arms deal. Uh, on at least two occasions, Murani has used his pulpit uh, to lash critics of the deal, that includes people like me, claiming that Mandela vocally, vocally and repeatedly supported the arms deal. To do so, Murano relied on a single speech that Mandela gave in 1999, where he gave a perfunctory salute to the arms deal, importantly years before the allegations of corruption and wrongdoing surfaced. Every senior government figure uh, has made much the same noise during the commission. Mandela's imprimatur, it was implied, cast a span on the deal magicking away the allegations of wrongdoing and misconduct, elevating the deal from its grubby reality to the sublime. On a second occasion, Morani was talking about the, the fact that myself and my colleagues Andrew Feinstein and Henny von Furen refused to testify before the commission as we felt that there were serious shortcomings with, the, with its conduct. Uh, he went out of his way, Morani went out of his way to compare us to Nelson Mandela and Nelson Mandela's appearance before a judge in the case brought by Louis Lake, uh, if anybody remembers that. He concluded by asking, I'd imagine rhetorically, who are these people compared to Mandela? It was a horrible wrangling of Mandela's history. It was also quite uh, distasteful to be on the end of that mangling. When Mandela appeared before the judge in that case, he didn't believe that uh, that judge was pursuing a, an alleged second agenda or trying to cover anything up. But what was unique about these statements, and what I found so interesting about them, was that they were actually surprisingly new. In the dozens of defenses of the arms deal wheeled out by government officials, cabinet ministers, and ex-presidents over the last 15 years, almost none of them has referred to Mandela's role. The only reason I can think they have been deployed now, and it's certainly not in desperation, as considering how often the commission has illustrated a distaste for us critics, is Mandela's passing. Perhaps it was considered just slightly too crass to use his memory when Mandela was still alive. Or perhaps there was the worry, albeit limited, that Mandela himself may have been forced to inveigh on the deal once his name was dragged into it. More likely, in my view, are two separate reasons. First, it is well known that Mbeki was often a pain to distance himself from, Man from Mandela and balked at the suggestion that things would fall apart without Mandela's presence. As, a, as such, Mandela, sorry, Mbeki and his cabinet colleagues would have been loath to justify the deal using Mandela's memory in this way. It needed to be justified on its own, t own terms. The second is that while Mandela was still alive, his myth was, at least in some ways, still tethered to his corporeality, a corporeality that imposed limits on just what his memory could be used to justify, distort, and disguise, lest the public revolt at the images of an old man being associated with acts beyond his control. Mandela's myth and memory was burnished by his passing and the public rememberings that followed. But it was also untethered from his reality, becoming a floating abstracted signifier of beneficence, one which can now be conjured at exactly those moments when the gulf is growing ever vaster between what he once stood for and the conduct of those who claim his memory as their own. Thank you. <laughs>